I am the Lord and there is none else. The Bible says that when he created the earth, he created it to be inhabited and he didn't create it in, in, uh, uh, in vain. So if the Lord created it to be inhabited, how come it's without form and void? So the question is, is how does it get without form and void? All right, first thing you've got to do is, is you're going to go to Second Peter. Now all this has to do with the deeps which is where we're going tonight, but you can't, you can't just go immediately to the deeps and go, well, let's just talk about the doctrine of the deep because it's all tied together. Second Peter chapter number 3. All right. That's pitiful. Pitiful. Sounds like an independent Baptist. That's funny. All right, 2 Peter chapter number 3. I'm looking for a verse there. As you look down through that passage right there in 2 Peter chapter 3, look in verse number 5. Uh, verse number 4. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? This is the scoffers in the last days. The scoffers, by the way, are in the church. It's not just in the world. 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 4. Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Why, you know as well as I do, the people in the world aren't worrying about the Lord coming back. This is people in the church that have been hearing the Lord was coming back all this time. So there come scoffers in the last days. What are they scoffing about? All things continue as they were since the beginning of creation. All right? For this, what? For this, they are willingly ignorant of. What is it they're willingly ignorant of? that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. That's not the same earth you're on right now. There was an earth here before that stood out of the water and in the water. That means part of the earth was submerged in water. It was floating like a cork, like a fishing cork out of there. And so that means, according to what the Bible just shows you right there, that there was a time when there was an earth that was here that floated out of the water and in the water. Now watch what happens. That particular earth right there, notice what he says, it is, he says, whereby the world that then was, in the past, then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But now watch it, the world, now notice that, Okay, world is always a reference to the, the, the population that is on the earth. The world that then was, per that was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth which are now. Well, now wait a minute. Well, which one's he talking about? Well, there must be a different one besides that one. So what happens here is, is that this thing right here, it has to have been inhabited by something. I didn't say it was inhabited by man. Because man doesn't get created until Genesis. Because Adam is the first man ever created and Adam is the first man that ever comes, comes along. Uh, and Eve is the first woman that's ever created. So there must have been something else here and the thing that was here has to do with sons of God. Now I'll get to the deeps here in a second, but before you get there, this earth right here being overflowed with water perished. Now, if you take your Bible and you study, and I'll give you the references here in just a minute, but the Bible says this. The Bible says the earth is his footstool. So what you do when you get ready to get up from a table, if you've got your feet propped up on a footstool, is, is you kick that thing away. And when that thing is overflowed with water, it means it's completely surrounded or submerged in water. Most people will tell you that that's Noah's flood. That's not Noah's flood. We're not even there yet. We're talking about the earth that then was, not the one which is now. The one which is now is going to be reserved unto fire to be destroyed in fire when the Lord comes back at the end of the second coming, after the end of the millennium, battle of Gog and Magog, right before the great white throne judgment. That's the one you're on right now. Look at it, what he says. But the heavens and earth which are now by the same of the kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So the Lord's talking about a different earth that's there. So what happens here is this earth is submerged. You say, preacher, how long was it submerged? I have no idea. It could have been a million years. It could have been 10 years. It could have been 10 minutes. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But I'll show you in just a second that now that that earth has been submerged in water, you say, why are you drawing uh, the, the, uh, a pyramid? Well, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, I would that you would know what is the length, the breadth, the depth, and the height 
And what he says there is when he mentions that, people say he's talking about the love of God. He's talking about a pyramid because that's the shape of the universe. All right, now put this to rest here for just a second, and I'll show you that about the size of the, of the uh, universe. Look in uh, Isaiah chapter number 14. We'll come back to Second Peter in just a minute. Isaiah chapter number 14. You ever wonder why when you pick up a compass, have you ever wondered why that compass uh, points due north? They say, well, it's magnetic north. Have you ever looked at a compass? In old days, a Boy Scout compass, you know what? The top of the compass was blue and the bottom was red. And the red pointed south and the blue pointed north. Well, I wonder what that is. Well, heaven is Isaiah 14. Heaven is blue and hell is red. Well, who would know that? How come it points north? Can I tell you why? Because that's where the Lord is. The Lord sits in the north. I'll show you in just a second. He says in Psalms uh, 78, it's on the right-hand page, on the right-hand column of the Old Schofield Bible, he'll say, uh, promotion cometh neither from the south, nor from the east, nor from the west, but from God. Well, God replaces the word north there. Where's God? He's sitting in the north. Over there in Leviticus, in the book of Leviticus, he says, when you go over there to offer that sacrifice, offer it on the north end of the altar where God sitteth. Why? Because God sits in the north. It isn't Santa Claus. You've been thinking all this time it was Santa Claus sitting in the north. It's not Santa Claus sitting up in the North Pole in an ice castle. You're getting close, though, because he sits up there and inhabits eternity where it's absolute zero, where the face of the deep is frozen. It's like ice. It's crystal. It reflects his glory back up there, which we'll get to in a minute. So here's what he says here in, in, uh, in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 14. The Bible says, uh, verse number 13, he said, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also, uh, notice, upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. In the sides of the north, he says. What's the sides of the north? That's the sides of the universe. These markers are not very good. I apologize for that. Isaiah chapter number 14. That's 13 and 14. This is called the sides of the north. Now, why is that important? Well, because somebody's going to come along and try to counterfeit that. You know what everybody's always trying to do? Everybody's always trying to tell you uh, what direction to go and where to go. When I die, I go due north. And I'll go through the deeps, which we'll talk about in a minute. But just so that you understand, up here above this thing right here is called the third heaven. Honey, would you do me a favor, please? Where'd honey go? Honey's gone. Richard, would you do me a favor, please? Uh, would you look on Drina's desk and bring me that other red marker? This one's blowed out. This is called the third heaven. Paul said, I was called up to the third heaven. And what was there? Paradise. Paradise is not heaven. Paradise was in heaven. Before... Paradise was in the lower parts of the earth. How many knew that? Go look in my office and bring me that chart. We're going to have to stop right there because you can't. You know the one I'm talking about? And it's uh, underneath the end table next to the couch in there. Please, and TK, I mean Roger, I have to help you. All right. So here's what happens. Somebody says, well, when you die, you go to paradise because the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, he says, I knew a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, who was caught up to the third heaven, and paradise was there. So heaven and paradise are the same thing. No, they're not. That comes from this doctrine. This doctrine is, is that, well, everybody's saved in the Old Testament the same way they're saved in the New Testament. Well, if they are, how come they don't go to the same place when they die? The rich man, when he died, where did he go? He went to hell, right? All right, let me ask you a question. The rich man went to hell. Where did Lazarus go? He went to Abraham's bosom. <laughs> well, I thought he went to heaven. When the thief on the cross died, where did he go? Today thou shalt be with me where? In paradise. We'll say, well, he must have gone to heaven. Got a problem there. You say, what's the problem? I don't mean to be smart with you, but you got a problem there. You say, why? Well, the Bible clearly teaches you that the Lord said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So he met the thief that day. But the Bible says in the book of, of, of Matthew, he says in Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 40, As Jonas was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. 
And so when he pops up there at the end of the resurrection, thank you, sir, when he pops up there at the end of the resurrection, uh, when he gets there, Mary reaches out there and says to him, you know, Master Rabboni, and he jumps back and he says, Mary, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Well, if paradise is up in heaven and Abraham's bosom's in heaven, then can you explain something to me? How come he said he hadn't gone up yet? Now, if you're taking notes, that's Ephesians chapter 4. Is not he that which ascended, he that descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Now, the reason I'm dogmatic about this stuff is, is because you can really mess up somebody doctrinally if you try to make people saved the same way in all the ages because you're going to wind up in trouble because you're going to not only bring the doctrine of eternal security into question, but you're also going to bring in salvation in the tribulation into question because the people in the tribulation don't go to heaven when they die. Those are souls under the altar. So I never heard such heresy in my life. Well, just hang on a minute. You're going to hear a whole lot more of it before the next two hours is over with. Uh, how about you fellows step up there on the platform so they can see you, and then I'll show them this thing right here. Now, I'll get back to this in just a second, but you've got to see this. And don't be intimidated by this. It took a lot of people a lot of years to learn this stuff right here. This is just a dispensational chart. This came from a Southern Baptist pastor from years ago. He used to teach this. He taught it for 40 years and, and, uh, in, in uh, Southern Baptist Church, if you can believe that. But he's got this thing right. This comes as parts of uh, Larkin's chart. All right? And so what he's done here is, is he's drawn out the different ages, the different dispensations. I don't have time to go into all that tonight. But here's Jesus Christ dying, so here's the church age. Now, here's the problem. The problem is, is before Calvary's cross right here, before they died, when they died, they couldn't go to heaven because their sins aren't paid for. It is not possible, the Hebrew says, that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. They're down in the heart of the earth. So now you understand that when they're down here in this place called uh, uh, hell, which is uh, on one side, uh, and on the other side, where's my hell at here? Down here. They're down here in hell, and paradise is not in a different place because the rich man goes to hell and Abraham, I mean Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom and the rich man looks across a great gulf fix. He doesn't look up into heaven. He looks across a great gulf fix and he says, I see Lazarus over there in Abraham's bosom. I pray that he would, I'm reading to you Luke 17, I pray that, or 15, I pray that he'll dip his finger in water and come and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. Right? All right. Well, he wasn't in heaven, but he was in Abraham's bosom. That's what he says to you in that particular story. So the question is, is where was it? Well, until Jesus Christ died on the cross and then was ascended, paradise was in the lower parts of the earth. And that has to do with where it is now because after Jesus Christ came, he led captivity captive after the three days he led captivity captive. Take your Bible and look in Ephesians chapter number 4. Okay, gentlemen, you can just take that and set that over there for right now. Just You don't have to worry about folding it. Look in Ephesians chapter number 4. Now, if you've got an old Schofield Bible, that's all I can go for. It's Ephesians chapter number 4, and it'll be on the right-hand page. It'll be a left-hand column. It'll be uh, about three verses from the top there, and it'll say... Uh, uh, when Jesus Christ led captivity captive, is not he uh, uh, that ascended, he that descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Do you see that on there? What verse is that? Eight and nine, did you say, Chief? Okay, verses, Ephesians 4, right? Ephesians 4, verses 8 and 9. All right, so what you have here is, is you have, you have uh, when Jesus Christ dies... He goes to the lower parts of the earth. So here he is on Calvary's cross. And he dies. And he tells the thief down here. It goes like this. <clears throat> and he says to the thief on the cross, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, right? That ain't going to work. That's better. Give me the, uh, give me the passage over there in, um, in uh, Luke. 
that gives you Abraham's bosom. 15, 16, left-hand page, right-hand column. 16, what's that, sis? All right, 16, that's good. All right, <clears throat> 1623. You want to write these references down now. You want to look at it. Because he says of this, and it came to pass the daughter to be fed of the crumbs, fed of the rich man's table, and the dog came, licked his sword, it came to pass the beggar died, was carried to the angels, Abraham's bosom, the rich man died, he didn't have to be carried anywhere, he naturally goes where he's supposed to go. If you're not saved, you go straight to hell. So if you're here tonight and you're not saved, you go straight to hell, you have no angels take you nowhere. There's some movie came out a long time ago where some demon comes up on the earth and grabs a guy. You don't have to take a guy's soul to hell. It'll naturally go to where it has a homing device just like you do. But it indicates that when you get saved, that a couple of fellows will show up and escort you home to your heaven, or to heaven, which is uh, where the Lord lives. Notice what he says, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. All right, this is called in the Old Testament, it's called Abraham's bosom. Why? Because it was all to the Jew. My goodness. All right, now over here is a place that we call hell. You say, well, what I really think is, no, this is, a, this is a, a, a grave for where the souls go. It's not a grave like up here in the ground. What they try to do is give you all these Greek and Hebrew words to confuse you, to make you think they're smarter than they really are. What happens is, is when Jesus Christ dies, his body goes into the grave over here. This is where he's at. But his soul goes down here into hell. Now get Acts chapter number 2. That's Luke 16... I'm going to have to erase all this in a minute so you get it while you can. That's Luke 16, 23, and that's Ephesians 4, verses 8 and 9. Um, and now you're in Acts chapter number 2. And uh, there'll be a passage there on the right-hand page, the left-hand column down there where the Lord will say to you that he uh, did not see, his body didn't see corruption, and he suffered that he would not leave his soul in hell. Somebody see that? Acts 2? 2.31. It's mentioned twice in Acts chapter number 2. There's a whole lot more in Acts chapter number 2 than just somebody, you know, repent and be baptized and, and the Holy Ghost being given and all that kind of stuff. That's the Peter talking about the Lord, and he's saying, I suffer thou will not leave my soul in hell. You remember the Lord crying, I, I thirst up there on the cross? That's the time of the Paschal lambs being burned, the Passover lambs being burned. All right, now I'm going to get to this in a second, but you've got to get this down here. So when Jesus Christ dies on the cross, his body is taken down from the cross, and his body is put into the grave over here. His soul comes over here. He preaches to the imprisoned saints here. I mean, the imprisoned angels and those that have died without doing what God wants them to do here. So right over on this side is, here's the rich man over here. What did he do? The Bible said he went to hell, Right? But he looks over here on this side, in this box up here, and he sees two people, and he recognizes Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom, and he can see them. He's not looking up here into heaven. So the Lord comes over here, according to what the Bible says in Second Peter or First Peter, chapter number three, and he preaches to the imprisoned uh, angels and the people of the Old Testament that all went to hell here that didn't do what God wanted them to do. And after he's done, the Bible says he takes the keys of hell and death with him. Isn't that a strange thing? Don't you think that it's funny that Peter don't have the keys? The Lord's got the keys. He has the keys in his girdle according to Revelation chapter number 1. You say, what are they, the keys? They're the keys to death and hell. You say, how do you translate the word hell in modern language, hell. That's the translation. You know what's a strange thing? They translate heaven, the word for heaven, in both Hebrew and Greek, they translate it every time as heaven. You know what, when it comes to the way they translate that word? Every time they'll change it into a transliteration instead of an actual meaning. How come they won't translate it the right word? You have to know Greek and Hebrew to know that. You can look it up. They, they want, because they don't like that word. Hell's an eternal place of burning. All right, now here's what I want you to understand. This place right here is where the thief on the cross went. 
And everybody who has trusted the Lord since where much art is, since Calvary right there, and everybody from Adam all the way up to Calvary, every one of those individuals goes down here if they've done what God wanted them to do during their time period. So the uh, rich man is over here, and what happens is, is he's able to see a cross. Now, where does Jesus go? He dies on the cross. His body goes to the hole in the ground. His uh, soul comes over here. His spirit returns to God. Into thy hands I commend my spirit's breath. It's just uh, another word for it is pneuma, like a pneumatic drill, air-driven drill, wind-driven drill. You have lung problems or breathing problems. You have what's called pneumonia, P-pneumonia. That's wind trouble, wind trouble. All right, so your spirit returns to God, and the soul goes where? Down here, but he says in Acts 2, he won't suffer to leave his soul there. What happens? Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He preaches to them in prison, and he says, Fellas, you're in here, and the deal's done, and your goose is cooked, and you ain't getting out. He takes the keys out of his belt, opens up the gate, goes out, and he crosses the great gulf fixed. This would be the gulf. I'll give you a better picture of this. You can't pay much attention to my chicken scratch right now. He walks across the great gulf fix, and he opens up the gate over here. And about that time, John the Baptist says, Well, look at there, fellows. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And that thief looks up there and says, I recognize that God. That's the same guy that was yeah. next to me on the cross right there. I saw him up there. And he walked up to the thief. He said, I told you today I'd see you in paradise. How you doing? Good to see you. And they go, oh, my goodness. And then what happened? He stays in the heart of the earth. You want to get this. This will be Matthew 12. It will be verse 40. Make, check that. Make sure that's right. Matthew 12, verse number 40. And it will say this. As Jonas was in the belly of the whale... Three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Where was the Lord? Is that the right one? All right. Where was the Lord after he died on the cross? Say, well, preacher, he went to heaven, you know. Not, well, not if the Bible's right. The Bible says he's in the heart of the earth for three days. Now you understand why it's important to understand where paradise is? Paradise is up there now, but originally it was in the heart of the earth. Now everybody that was in paradise and the actual place called paradise not just the people, the place. The Lord blew the lid off the thing here and took it captive and put it up there in the third heaven. Now, a little scientist catch up with that one. Yeah, right. That'll knock his socks off. He took a literal place. I'll give you a better one than that. He took the tree of life with him up there. Literal tree. You know where it is right now, right? You say, well, it's, you know, no, it's not in the heart of the earth. He took it up to heaven with him. It's up there. You can read about it in Revelation. You say, where's the Ark of the Covenant? It's up in heaven with him. You say, why? The Lord has a way of being able to transport large objects yeah. through wormholes or whatever. <laughs> All right, so Matthew chapter number 13, the Bible says he was in the heart of the earth for three days. Now you understand when he tells Mary, don't touch me, I have not yet ascended to the Father. All right, so once you get that and once you understand that, you understand that now that paradise is there, paradise is not heaven. And, but before that, they had no way to cross over where we're fixing to go here. They couldn't get through this body of water that's up here because they had no way to pass through the body of water. You have to have a special invitation, and the waters have to be split for you to get through. Kind of like Exodus chapter number 14 when they come, the children of Israel come through the Red Sea. You think that's a coincidence, it's a Red Sea? Can I ask you a question? How is it you get into heaven? You come through the blood, don't you? Yes, sir. Amen. What color is the blood? Red. Well, the Lord just happened to name that sea over there that they came through out of Egypt. They called it the Red Sea. You think it's a coincidence? The author of that book wrote it, and he says, I need a good picture of that. What can I do? He said, I don't know. I think, let's see. I'll get the children of Israel over here. Pharaoh, he'll be a type of, of the devil. Moses can be a type of me. I've got to get a way to get them through to Canaan. They got to go through the blood. What am I going to do there? Oh, okay. And when he has that sea named, whoever named that sea, the Red Sea, said, you know what's a good name for this sea, right? We'll call it Red Sea. Yeah. And Lord said, that'll be good. Mark her down. And he wrote it down, Red Sea. And then Moses comes up there, and he stretches out his rod, and the Red Sea parts, and the children go across on dry ground into the land of Canaan. You know why? Because it's a picture of your salvation. You went through the blood of Jesus Christ yeah. to get over to the other side. Yeah. And you know what will happen? The Lord will go, come up here there, and we'll all get there, and we'll all go, man, 
man, Lord, how are we going to get across this big body of water? He'll say, oh, yeah, that, you know. <laughs> I forgot it. Let me fix that for you right now. <laughs> and he'll wave his arm like that, and you'll see some water. I'll show it to you in just a minute. That water will go like that, and the Lord will say, let's go. <laughs> and you're going to cross through the Red Sea. He's going to astonish you what you see in the waters around you. Because in Genesis chapter number 1, he'll tell you that the stuff that's up there in the deeps is unclean. You read Genesis, you ever read through it real slow? And the heaven and the earth he created in the first day, and he saw that it was good. And the second day, and he saw that it was good. And the third day, and he saw that it was good. And the fourth day, and the fifth day, he saw that it was good. And the sixth day, he saw it. Lord, how come that? Well, see, when I created that thing, there's something out there in that, and I, it's not good, so I can't say nothing about it. It's right there in the reading, but who paid attention to that? How come the Lord didn't say it was good? Thought everything God created was good, unless there was something in it that dirtied it up. All right, now we get back to this. I guess you got to have that squirty stuff on this thing. I'm sorry. Oh, that makes a nice big mess. <laughs> wow. It cleans it up, but it makes a mess, don't it? All right, might want to get me a couple of paper towels or something, please, somebody. All right, let's get back over this thing about the sides of the north. Why is it important about the sides of the north? Well, you've got to understand all that kind of stuff right there, and you'll see where it all ties in a little bit. Up here is the third heaven. This is heaven number three, the third heaven. God does things in threes, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, body, soul, spirit. There's a lot of threes that are all through the Bible. God likes that number three. Three in your Bible is a number for resurrection. After three days, you'll rise again. Runs all the way through there. You'll go a couple of thousand years, and the third day you go and you start the millennial kingdom, resurrection that takes place. All right, so now paradise is up here in heaven. That's where it is for right now. That's the third heaven. Second heaven, I'll get to in just a second. That's your solar system. And I should have drawn that a lot bigger so you'll be able to see it. All right, so let's, let's draw this thing like this. I got to have some paper towels or something, or a rag or a napkin or something. While we're doing this right here, if you would please look in uh, Psalms chapter number uh, 48. Psalms chapter number 48. Thank you, TK. Appreciate that. Psalm 48, and somebody, when you get that, if you will, read for me real loud. Psalms 48 and verse number 2. What we're looking for is the Mount Zion, the great city in the, in the sides of the north. That's what we're looking for. Okay, so the, right now the universe, the Lord has fixed it where He wears the universe. He can, he's contained in the universe. Uh, he's everything in the universe and everything outside of the universe. But right now he's got the thing fixed and it's got sides on it. And those sides are described to you by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul tells you the length, the breadth, the depth, and the height. And that will be the pyramid. That's the Jerusalem. That's a city built. New Jerusalem is built like it. It's a uh, city built four square. Well, that means a pyramid on the bottom has a square like this. And then it has four sides on it like this. So it looks like an X. Like those three pyramids I told you about the other day. There's three pyramids that are over there in Egypt. Doesn't resemble anything that you're familiar with, I'm sure. That's three crosses. And the one in the middle is the biggest one of all of them. And those things that are here on the earth, they're shadows, they're types, they're figures of the things that are up in heaven. Everything you see down here, including the tabernacle, the temple, including the, the way Jerusalem is laid out with the Dead Sea at the bottom, all those things are type pictures of the tabernacle and what's laid, on, laid up for you in heaven. So this thing has to do, this is a, this is a pyramid, all right? Uh, in the book of, let's see, that'll be Hebrews chapter number 1 when he talks about taking off the, uh, the universe and folding up the universe as a garment. That'll be Hebrews chapter number 1. Somebody have to give me the verse. 
That's because his head is above that. That's why you can never drown. Your head is Jesus Christ. So when he talks about the head of the church, which is Christ, what he's trying to tell you is, is listen, as long as my head's above the water, it don't matter if the water's up to my neck, I can't drown. I'm eternally secure. You say, why? My head's above the water. I can't drown in the water because I'm in Christ. I'm seated with him in heavenly places. So Jesus Christ is up here in the third heaven. That's what you want to get a hold of. Hebrews 1, it'll be on the left-hand page down at the bottom of the left-hand column. It'll say, uh, it'll say something about um, um, he foldeth up the, the universe as a garment. No. As, as a vesture, thou shalt fold them up. That's it. As a vesture, thou shalt fold them up. What verse is that? 12. Hebrews 1.12? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I had the chapter right anyway. All right? Uh, as a vesture. All right, so now here's the, the Lord. He goes over there, and he's got on a garment. And that garment is, you know, they made a movie called The Robe and all that other kind of stuff. But that garment's got a hole in the middle of it. And his head's above that. So when the thing falls, it falls just like that around him the type picture of what he's wearing now you know what they wanted to do they stripped him of his what garments so when I told you the other day they were making fun of him on the cross I wasn't being silly they were the Bible says in Matthew 27 they walked by they mocked him they laughed at him they wagged their heads what are they doing they're laughing at his at his uh, anatomy so what the Lord's going to do in Hebrews 1 is, is he's going to say, you wanted to laugh at my glory, did you? I'm going to show you my glory for sure. And he'll take off the whole, gar the whole garment, the whole universe, and he'll fold it up, just shake it out like that, and fold that thing up. And Now, that would be a pretty big God to wear the universe for a... You see how big God is? That's a pretty big God, isn't it? He'll take that thing off and shake the thing out and fold it. And, buddy, when his righteousness is revealed, it'll doesn't it say it'll burn up everything? Well, guess what? That's Second Peter chapter 3. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. That's the Lord doing that. All right, now, so you want to get a hold of how the universe is shaped. That's why he said, where is it at? His house is in Mount Zion, the great city in the sides of the north. Beautiful for situation, Mount Zion in the sides of the north. All right, let me give you one more here. Psalm 75 and verse number 6. Psalm 75 and verse number 6. When somebody gets that and you read it out to me real loud. Huh. But, next verse, verse 7. But God is the judge. He put us down one and set us, set us up another. Okay, so he says, promotion cometh not from the east, the west, or the south, but God. Well, what's God filling in there? The north. So where's your promotion come from? So the only way you can get promoted is to go through somebody that's in the north, right? That's the North Pole. Well, you think it's an odd thing that Santa Claus wears a, a red garment? You ever read the Bible in Isaiah? Isaiah says, who is this that coming with garments dipped in blood that died in the red garments of Bozrah? You know what he does? He sees you when you're sleeping, and he knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. And you say, who is that? Well, let me ask you a question. Who comes through and is not bound by time? Jesus Christ makes four trips after he goes there in, uh, in, uh, uh, after the resurrection when he steps out of the tomb. He makes four trips up to heaven and back up to heaven and back. Four times he's not bound by time. He can be here and here and here. Well, isn't that what so-called uh, Santa Claus does? Doesn't he do that? Then in one night he goes around the whole world and you know gives all the little toys to all the little boys and girls and all. If your kids are in here, I'm sorry I'm messing them up there, but <laughs> teach them this. This would be better for them anyway. Say, Mom and Daddy earned that with the sweat of their brow. So, yeah, that's right. Now teach them that. That'd be a whole lot safer than them to grow up later on and think, well, if you lied to me about that and you lied to me about Jesus Christ, I've never seen him either. I'm not trying to take your fun away. Put your tree up, give you presents, but tell them where it came from. That costs dollar bills. You know, teach them to pray to, teach them to be, suffer the little children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of God. Is that what he says? Okay, so what do you do? You go sit on Santa Claus's lap or Jesus's lap? Well, isn't that strange? I bet you never would have to worry about your kids sitting in Jesus's lap. 
But if you knew what I knew about a lot of these people that play Santa Claus at Christmas time, you'd be real slow about having them take their picture at the mall with Santa. Yeah, you'd be real surprised. That's part of the old career I had for a long period of time. You'd be surprised how many individuals, you know, enjoy being around little children in the name of something like that. Well, preacher, it's all done. Some of you are looking at counting the carpet weave now. You're like, why does he have to bring all that stuff up, man? <laughs> this is the peacock raw tonight. That's <laughs> this is un unsheeted. You know a fellow that comes, uh, uh, he comes uh, on, on a sleigh, the book of Isaiah. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about a sled there. Who else do you know that has four-footed flying beasts? They're not reindeer. They're horses. Where'd they get that? Where does he live? In the North Pole. Well, what'd they, what'd they take that out of your book for? Trying to replace him with something else? I think so. All right, so he's, uh, he's up there in the north. All right, so we, we established that it's in the sides of the north. That, that thing I gave you in Leviticus, it's uh, Leviticus chapter 1, and it's verses 10 and 11 where he talks about offering the sacrifice there and offering it on the side of the north there. Why? Because that's where God's at. That's why all your compasses, people don't even realize it, they look at a compass and it points north. You know why? Because that's where home's at if you're saved. And it's blue. But if not, the, end of the other, other end of the compass is red. That's hell. That's where you're going if you're not saved. You Bible right there telling you what's going on. They, the, they invent a compass and that thing goes... They say, what is that? Well, that's north. How come the thing points north? Why didn't it point west? Why does north wind up being that way? Because that's where the Lord's at. He's in the sides of the north. All right, now you get into this thing about uh, come back to the book of uh, Genesis again uh, and go to Genesis chapter number 1. Genesis chapter number 1. Genesis chapter number 1. It'll be verse number 6. Read real loud for me there. 6 to about 8. All right, now, we have this earth that was here before, which I'll get to what was on it in just a second, but I want to establish the one you're on now. This earth right here is drowned out in this water. Now look how your Bible reads. He says, let the waters be divided from the waters. So if I were to take that bottle of water and I wanted to divide the waters from the waters, I'd go along the middle of the thing and I'd put a dam on this side and I'd put a dam on this side and I'd create a thing in here called the empty place. You know what, that's, what that is? That's your solar system. That's where your stars are. Okay? That's called the empty place. Uh, take your Bible and look in that thing in Job chapter 26. And we'll come back here to this thing about dividing the waters. Job chapter number 6. There's a place in your Bible that's referenced to uh, a place called the empty place. That's your solar system. 6. Job chapter number 20, I'm sorry, 26 is correct. 26, verse number 7. Somebody got it? He stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Okay, who lives in the north? God. 
Okay? So he stretches out the north over the empty place. Okay? Right? And hangeth the earth upon nothing. All right? So the first earth that was here before being overflowed with water. You with me? Overflow with water. Now all of a sudden he's going to start over and he goes, I'll put this water up here and this water down here. Now you have an empty place called the solar system. And now you have the place where your sun, your moon, your stars, and so on and so forth is called, we call it space or outer space. Now you get the first heaven here. The first thing here is called the atmosphere. People say, when you get to heaven, there's three heavens. No, there's not. There's only one heaven, capital H, where God lives. It's in your Bible. The other heavens are heavens that apply here. First heaven is your atmosphere. Atomosphere. The second heaven is your solar system. And the third heaven, says Tim, is where God lives. That's the third heaven. Three heavens. Thank you very much. Oh, that black will be nice. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. I don't know about that pink, but I can use the black. <laughs> All right, now, so what he does is he divides the waters from the waters. All right, so here's the first question here that comes up. Okay, well, preacher, then if there is between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, we'll get to the deeps in a second, we're not even there yet. All this leads up to that. He divided the waters from the waters. That's not oceans from oceans and seas from seas. That's not him taking the water that is on the earth. And interestingly enough, this time he divides the waters from the waters, but in Noah's flood they were assuaged from off the earth. That means they're mopped up from off the earth. This one's different. This one is completely underwater. So what is right here during this time? Well, preacher, I don't believe in a pre-Adamite race. Okay, well, don't believe it. It don't make no difference. But let's, could you just do this for the sake of conversation tonight? Could you just understand that, first of all, there was one earth that was here. And the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter, or 2 Peter chapter number 3, it was floating out of the water and in the water. It's not that earth. This one's floating out of the water and in the water. That one he divided the waters from the waters. That's a different one. That's reserved unto fire. So if there was something here, we might be able to find something about what might have been here during that particular time. So take your Bible and let's take a look at what these things are that might have been on here at that particular time. Uh, look at um, Job chapter number 38. Job chapter number 38. And look at verse number, well, just start in verse number 1, Job 38. Notice what he says. The Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like the man, for I will demand of thee, and answereth thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? And declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched a line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof found, fastened? He hung it on nothing. He's asking Job, where, where's the foundation? Who laid the cornerstone of it? When I, when I put the earth out there, who did it? Watch when he took it place. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You know what he indicates there? He's saying to you, look in Job chapter number 1. He's saying something was here and they're called sons of God. I never said to you that the sons of God were human beings. As a matter of fact, if we have time tonight, I'll show you that every time an angel shows up in the Bible, he appears as a man, but he's not a man. Nowhere in your Bible does any at any time does an angel appear as a blonde-headed woman with wings. The only time a female shows up that looks anything like an angel at all is in Zechariah chapter number 5. And that thing has to do with a, a, an ephod with a lead lid on the top of it flying through there. And it has two women in there with long flowing hair and they have wings of a stork. 
Now, I don't know why this is that people don't understand this, but when you see these big angels standing with this blonde hair and this blue eyes, and they think, well, that's what an angel is. Well, how can you entertain angels unaware if a guy shows up and he's got six-foot white wings on his back? <laughs> or if it's a woman, how come nowhere in your Bible, whether it's in the book of Genesis 18, Genesis chapter 20, Judges chapter number 13, Acts chapter number 2, and in the book of Luke and John when the angels are sitting there and announcing uh, uh, the Lord not resurrecting all. It says angels, men, angels, men, angels, men, angels, men. Manoah says it was an angel. No, it was a man. No, it was an angel. No, it was a man. And Lot's day, it was an angel. It was a man. It was an angel. It was a man. When the Lord entertains the, the people come down, Abram entertains them there and puts out fresh beef and milk and all that kind of stuff. It says the men said, the men said, the men said, the angel said, the men said, the angel said. You know why? In Matthew chapter 22, you know what the Bible says? He says, you know, when you die, you'll be as the angels who are neither married or given in marriage in the resurrection. So whose wife it's going to be ain't going to make no difference. You say, why? You'll be as the angels. Well, how are the angels? Well, every time they show up in the Bible, they're male. It's not sexless, like even the old Schofield thing says. It has nothing to do with sexless. You lose your shape. You lose your image. You're conformed to your father when you get up there. You'll be like him. You're called sons of God. I don't have to upset you ladies, but you're not called daughters of God. You're called sons of God. Don't throw up. You'll look like Jesus. You really want to look like yourself for the rest of eternity? Honestly, honest to God, do you really? God, have me delivered, man. I mean, you talk about a facelift, man. I want one when I get up there. I won't want to look like him. Don't, don't recognize me for who I am. Recognize who he is. That's a hard thing to grab a hold of. But that thing has to do with angels. Those are sons of God, but they're not human. You understand? They're not human beings. Job chapter number, did I give you chapter number one? Job chapter number one, look in verse number six. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Sons of God. That's not me and you. Job's the oldest book in the Bible, by the way, not Genesis. Jump on down to verse number or, or chapter number 2 and look in verse number 1. And again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. You want to look this thing up? It's all through the book of Psalms where the Lord will talk about God's, 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 God's little g. Acts chapter number 17, the gods have come down among us, Jupiter and Saturn and so on and so forth. They're angels that appear as men. Now, here's a good one. Go to Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis chapter number 6. What's around during this time right here is called the sons of God. Now the reason that people have a real problem with this is, is they say Adam was the first man created and therefore there couldn't have been a pre-Adamite race of people. You're right, there wasn't. I never said they were people. I said they were angels. There's four cherubim up there in heaven and the Bible teaches you clearly in Ezekiel chapter number 28, he says to Satan, Lucifer, Luxfier, like bearer, he says to Satan, thou art the fifth cherub that covereth. What was he? He was over those four cherubim and he was in charge of the earth. But guess what happened? He messed the thing up. Can I just ask you a question? Would you just reason with me for a second? How come it is that when Eve is created, when the devil shows up, the tempter in Genesis chapter number 3, he's already in a fallen state. When did he fall? If he didn't fall before. When did he fall? You have an answer for that? They can never answer that. Well, when did he, well, well he's, he's going to... What they do is run to Revelation chapter 12 and talk about a third of the angels coming after him. That's, that's something that will take place later on. That goes with Jeremiah chapter 4 that has to do with what the devil's going to do in the tribulation. It has nothing to do with Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. Nothing. It's just I've already made up my mind what this is and I'm not going to believe what the Bible says. Don't confuse me with the facts. <laughs> Well, I just can't imagine that it would be something like that. What, what were they? I don't know what they were. The Bible just says they, when they appeared, they appeared as men. That's what the Bible says. In the book of Hebrews, he says, be careful that he entertain, uh, under, entertain angels unaware. Well, how can you entertain an angel unaware if he walks by and he's got wings flapping out of his back? The most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. That's why that thing, when you see those pictures of them women with wings and long blonde hair, that, I told you earlier, that's Zechariah chapter number 5, and that has to do with the Bible says this is wickedness. That's a demonic thing. Now, don't go busting all your angel's wings off of them and all that kind of stuff. You know, bust the wings off your angels. You know, every time you see an angel at Walmart, you knock the wings off of it and go tell everybody, you know, we know angels don't have wings and all. Okay, you're spiritual and everything, but 
It's a representative of what's up there in heaven because they can't figure out how could something fly without wings. I'll tell you how. God. You're going to fly one day. You know what happens? The Lord's walking on the road to Emmaus. He just appears there. And the next thing you know, he appears in the upper room and walks through a wall. How did he get there? He flew. How? Faster than a speeding bullet. <laughs> Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. <laughs> That's how. He just thought it. I need to be in the upper room. There he is. You say, what is that? Traveling at the speed of the Lord, not the speed of light. Yeah, you don't have, to have nothing to carry him. He goes up there to the Lord and makes his presentation and comes back down walking on the road to Emmaus. Man, where have you been? <laughs> I've been to the other side of Alpha Draconis and back. What? Never mind, you wouldn't understand. That's the Lord. They don't, he, somebody says, you know, there's spaceships coming and this kind of a thing. I wonder if the Lord's going to be in one of them. The Lord don't have to be in no spaceship, man. The Lord gets ready to appear. You know what he does? He just shows up. Right. Genesis chapter 11, he says, boy, listen to what they're saying down there. I think what we'll do is we'll go down there and visit them. Well, I don't really like what they're having to say. Pfft, next thing you know, he's walking around down there looking around what they're doing, building the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11. Watch 11. 11s, 11s, 11s. Wasn't that 9, 11, 2000? Or 2000, what was that? Was that? Huh? September the 11th, 2001. September the 11th. 11. Train. Genesis 11, Tower of Babel. God said, I've had enough. You people keep coming together, coming together, coming together, coming together. I told you to get apart, get apart, get apart. You think you can get to me by works? You think you can get to me by building a tower? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to mess up your towers and I'm going to confound your language. Coincidence? Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> probably has nothing to do with anything. All right, these things have to do with the sons of God. What verse of scripture did I give you? Did I give you Genesis, 1, Genesis 6 yet? All right, Genesis chapter number 6. Now, I can't quote the whole passage to you there, but there's going along there, and uh, the Lord goes along, and he says uh, that there came a time when the sons of God saw the daughters of men. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair to look upon, and they took to themselves wives, and giants were born unto them. Isn't that what he says? Well, where's your giants today? You say it's Shaq, Shaq O'Neal. Oh, come on, man. I'm talking real giants. I'm not talking about a, a fellow that can dunk a basketball. He's a big fella, I admit. He, by my standard, he's a giant. I'm talking 20 to 30 feet tall, man. I'm talking Greek mythology. I'm talking Goliath, 18 feet tall, 13-foot bed, six toes, six fingers. I'm talking big things, giants. I'm not talking little, little P-dabs, that kind of a deal. You say, what happened? Well, I've got to go to the book of Jude now to show you this. This has to do with the sons of God. The sons of God are not human beings. So when I tell you that's what's here to begin with, that's what's here to begin with. It's not humans. You say, well, no, it'd it, it, it have to be humans. Well, you've got to stop thinking that way. You mean there might be something else out there? Yes, there might be. You say, what is it? Well, whatever it is, it's demonic. You don't want nothing to do with it. Do you believe in UFOs? I've seen a lot of things. I, don't, I've seen, I believe in earthly UFOs, man. <laughs> Not just flying objects. I mean, I believe in UEOs, unidentified earthly objects. I was at Walmart today, man. Have you looked around? <laughs> what was that? Uh, you can't tell what a lot of it is anymore. They just had this dance thing on the other day, and, and, and I flipped the thing on right there, and my wife said, that's uh, uh, this lady's uh, uh, daughter. Yeah, the black-hatted lady. What was her name? Somebody said it. I'm not trying to trap you. Don't worry. Yeah, you know, the uh, Sonny and Cher thing, that, the Cher lady. That's her daughter. I said, what? Trina said, honey, that's one of those unidentified earthly objects. I said, look at that. That, what? Are you serious? He goes, that's a woman. I said, man, you got to be kidding me. And they're making a big deal about this thing dancing out there. I'm thinking, just stand there and let everybody look at you. You're pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's a pretty big deal. Yeah. <laughs> and to be something you're not, stand there and let me figure out, what, what are you? Where's your head at? Anyway, Jude. Jude, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be offensive to you. Good godly people, you know. You just, those people can't, they can't help it. Okay. Uh, oh, did God make them that way? 
You be careful what you get on this preacher about. Last time I checked, now there may be a new version out, but the last time I checked the King James Bible, the Bible said God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. So I'm just saying. All right, Jude, Old Schofield Bible, it's um, left-hand page, right-hand column. And he comes down there, and what he says is uh, he's making a comparison there to the people in Sodom and Gomorrah going after strange flesh. You see that in there? And he's making a comparison there, and then he comes down and he mentions to you, uh, brother, you see that thing right there about angels? Jude, the book of Jude. You see it right there? TK, Brother Joffrey, somebody, one of you got it? It'll say, all right, Chief, you got it? What, is it? what does it say? Can you read it real loud for me? And the angels which kept not their first estate. Oh, okay, wait, wait. They kept not their first estate. Where were they originally? Well, Job 38 said they could get up there when the sons of God sang and shouted for joy. They kept not their first estate. Wonder where their first estate was. You don't think it'd be up there where God was, do you? When the sons of God saw the daughters of men that were fair to look upon, we're talking about this earth over here, right? Yep. All right, they kept not their first estate, but did what? But left their own habitation. Doing what? How come they left their first estate? It's in there. I know it's in there. I've read it. Going after... Even as Sodom and Gomorrah yeah. and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to there it is. Are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. All right. So he's saying about the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, they're an example. What of? They're an example of what the angels did. What'd they do? They went after strange flesh. What was it? Genesis 6, human beings. That's where your giants came from. Why, ladies and gentlemen... That's where all of your hybrids came from. That's why in your King James Bible you have satyrs. Half man, half goat. You say, preacher, I don't believe it. Well, you wouldn't if you didn't have a King James Bible. So, well, that's mythology. No, it's not. It's truth. A satyr's in your Bible. You say, what's a satyr? Well, the original Hebrew word there for satyr really is talking about an ox that's been goaded into becoming... A, oh, cut it out, man. A satyr is a half man, half goat, and it has to do with a compilation of, into, of, of an angel mixing with an animal, jumping the genetic code. That's why he tells David, when you go down there to Egypt... You can't have them horses down there. And when you go down there, you cut off, you howl, he says. You cut their, their tendon, their Achilles tendon. You say, why? Well, I don't mean to be crude, but that's to keep them from getting on their hind legs. You fill in the blanks. Why? Because they're crossing something. Going after strange flesh. You say, why? Because now they have it in them, the ability. You know why in the book of Leviticus, he says that a woman's not to lay down with an animal? You say, well, that's just filthy, that's just nasty, that's bestiality, that's just filthy and dirty and all that. No, there was a time when that combination would produce offspring. That's why the Lord had to kill all the animals. The angels messed them up. That's too wild for you, though, ain't it? You're like, preacher, that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. Okay, well, wait to get to heaven, the Lord will straighten you out. I'm positive of it. I know it. I'm positive of it. The stuff you read in Greek mythology, did any of you have that when you come up in school? I had it about the eighth grade. All that stuff, Medusa with snakes in her hair and, and the fellow with wings on his feet and Thor able to throw lightning and stuff like that. What is that? That's a supernatural hybrid. I said you are gods, he says in Psalms, but you shall die like men. You say, why? You went after strange flesh. You left your first habitation. I'm going to change some of you in darkness unto the day of judgment. No, you're not that you shall judge angels. Why would you judge angels? Because they left their first habitation going after strange flesh. Why was it strange to them? Because they're not human. They're angels. But God don't even take the free will away from them. You say, where were they? Why, they sang and shouted for joy right here in Job chapter 38, verse number 7. But you know what happened? The devil said this. He said, you know what? I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. I'm going to set my throne above the stars of heaven. I'm going to go up. And the Lord said, that's it, buddy. And he cast him down. That's why when you get to Genesis chapter number 3, he's already fallen. You say, where was that? That was right here. You know what the Lord did? He kicked his footstool away from him. And the earth that then was, 2 Peter chapter number 3, being overflowed with water, perished. No men at all.
That's what was here. Because the earth didn't create, the, the Lord didn't create the earth without form and void. Well, he couldn't inhabit it with the angels because they blew it with a cherub over them and everything being perfect. And they're up there every morning when the sun comes up and they're singing and shouting before the Lord because the Lord at that time is right here, man. Here's the Lord's throne right here. And they're right there. And the devil says, I'm going to put my throne above his throne. Same thing they did in Genesis chapter 11. And the Lord kicked them down. And he drowned them out in the water. They went somewhere. I'm not saying, but they went somewhere. That thing's built like a skin, like in Job 41. Water can't get through it. It's pressurized. It goes into the heart of the earth. I don't know where they went, but some of them survived. You say, how do you know? Genesis 6, they come back again. Daniel chapter 2, know you not that iron will be mingled with clay. All these people telling you about UFOs coming and there's going to be things that are going to come down here and that they're going to have Rosemary's baby and all that kind of stuff. Daniel chapter number 2, the Bible says in the tribulation that they're going to come back again and iron type of the devil is going to mix with clay type of a human being and you're going to have your hybrids all over again. That's fallen angels. They've been here before, Acts chapter 17. You say they come in spaceships and fly. They don't need spaceships, man. They can move from heaven to earth. There was a movie. I've seen it since the first time I used this illustration, so this is going all over everywhere, so everybody will think I'm wicked and that kind of a stuff. But my wife made me watch it one time. She said it was a chick flick, you know, so I had to, <laughs> my wife's fault, so blame my wife, you know. But she must be in the nursery. There's this uh, thing with this cage fella in it. Um, I'll think of it in a minute. I'm trying to trap you. They all run around in black coats and all. They go out to the beach in the morning and sing Angels, uh, uh, City of Angels. Now, here's a strange thing about that. That fella comes up there and he loses his habitation. You know how he loses his habitation? Uh, he chooses to a woman. You know what happens? There's a scene in that thing right there where she thinks he's a little weird and something's off with him, that kind of a deal. And he, she reaches over there and she grabs a butcher knife and whoosh, she cuts him and cuts him right through the fingers. And the fingers don't get cut and there's no blood. Well, who doesn't know that with the King James Bible? They ain't got blood. They have to have blood to be able to cohabitate. So when he left his first estate and made the decision, he falls in an elevator shaft or something. I don't remember what it is. But he gets up and he's wiping blood from his nose. Where do you think they get that stuff? That's right in your Bible. Know you not that flesh and, bone cannot, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God? The Lord says to him when he comes up in heaven, you know what he says? I mean, comes up from resurrection, you know what he says? Come see me and handle me, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone. No blood. Some of you are kind of like, what? So what's here before was not human. It's angels. They would have looked like men, but they would not be men. I said, you're gods, and you're going to die like men. You know what happens? They wind up dying. All right, now we've got to go over here to this thing here. That's the first earth that's overflowed with water, and it perished. It's gone now. Okay? That's not Noah's flood. Noah's flood takes place in Genesis chapter number 7. And we're going to get to Genesis chapter number 7 in just a minute, but you've got to get this right here because there's a door right here in the north. That'll be Revelation chapter number 4. There's a door that's right there, and there's windows down here. All right, so he divides the waters from the waters. So what does he do to hold those, uh, hold those waters back, preacher? How does, he, how does he manage to keep those things? All right, let's look at Psalms chapter 148. Psalms chapter 148. Now, if you just came in, we we're just doing a little Bible study here, and, and uh, we've been at it for a little while, about 15 or 20 minutes, so... And uh, if you need to go, go ahead. I understand. No problem. Psalms chapter number uh, uh, 148. I'm looking in 48. That's all I want. Yeah, 48. there it is. All right, now watch how he sets this thing up. This has to do with the firmament. This has to do with how he sets up the firm expanse. Firmament. 
If it's water, how can it be firm? Well, let's see what the Bible says. Praise you the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him His angels. We're up here and all the hosts. Praise Him sun and moon. Here we are right down here. Praise Him all the stars of light. Praise Him in the heaven of heavens. And ye waters that be above the heavens, plural, above two heavens, waters above heavens, two heavens. Got to have two heavens, right? First heaven, atmosphere. Second heaven, solar system. Well, where are those waters? Praise ye the waters that be above the heavens. They're well, right there. That's called the great deeps. There's water over your head. You just can't see it because you're looking at the wrong side of the glass. All right, look in Job chapter number 37. Job 37. Now, if anything, I hope that you don't get anything out of this but the fact that it's ought to magnify God to you and help you realize how stupid you really are. And I'm not saying that to be an insult, but there's a lot of things about God in the Bible you don't know. You just think all, all the Bible is about telling me do right, do right, don't, don't do this and don't do that and quit this and quit that and get saved and don't go to hell. Right? You know, you got a witness and all that other kind of stuff. Well, there's a whole lot more in there. You know what this will do? If you study this stuff out, this will make you realize there's a mighty big God you're worshiping up there. Amen. Job chapter number 37, verse number 9. The Bible says, Out of the south cometh a whirlwind. Cold cometh out of where? North. Who lives in the north? God. All right, watch it. By the breath of God, frost is given. By the gr breath of God, watch it. Of, I mean, uh, by the breath of God, frost is given. And by the breath of the waters... Hmm. The breadth of the waters is what? How do you straighten water? You'd freeze it, wouldn't you? Uh, look a little bit further. We're looking at the chapter, same chapter. Look in verse number 18. Verse number 18. Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass? What would that be like? Would you think that might be? It's just a suggestion now. Would you think that might be like ice? A molten looking glass. You ever notice how much glass looks like ice when you freeze it? We'll talk about the dark side in just a minute. Verse number 22, the same chapter. Fair weather cometh out of the north, which God, uh, uh, with God is terrible majesty. So we're talking about where it all comes from by the breath of God. The face is straight, it's, it's the molten glass, it, the waters are straightened. All right, look in Job 38 and look in verse number uh, 30. Job 38, verse number 30. The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. The waters are hid as a stone. So this side of the mirror right here would be dark. Facing down. The face of the deep up here, the Bible just told you, the face of the deep is what? Frozen. Now you understanding what's holding the water back? Uh, let's go just a little bit further and then I want to take you and show you something. Look at uh, Revelation chapter number 4. Revelation chapter number 4. John's called up to the third heaven, right? 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 All right, watch what he says. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened where? Would that be in the atmosphere? Would that be in the solar system? What heaven do you think that would be? That would be right here, wouldn't it? John said, I look, and behold, there was a... Well, why? Because you're fixing to see what's on the other side of that door. Now, the reason this is important is, is because this huge expanse of water that's here and here, something is in this, swimming in that right now, and chained in that right now. There's disembodied spirits here, but Job 41, he maketh the deep hoary. He maketh the deep hoary. That means bubbling, white, uh, foamy. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. The deep, so the, your interpreters tell you this. Well, in the Hebrew, that word deep really means, or well, what he's trying to say there is, is that it means a, a, a whirlpool like the sea or the ocean. 
So when they're talking about Leviathan, they say Leviathan. Well, what that means is, instead of twisted or crooked one, what that really means is, is alligator or hippopotamus or whirlpool because they're trying to make the deep hoary and boiling like a pot a body of water on the earth. It's not. It's a seven-headed red dragon that's swimming around up here and he's making that deep to boil like a pot. If you'd leave the cotton-picking Bible like it is, you'd find out he ain't always talking about you down here. He's talking about something up here and that has to do with he making the deep. So Leviathan, you say, what is he? Well, Isaiah 27, 1, Revelation chapter number 13, he says, using the same word Leviathan, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, that crooked serpent, the beast, it's the devil. All you have to do is compare Scripture with Scripture. You don't have to know a bit of Hebrew at all. You don't have to get you a Hebrew lexicon, get you a strong thing, look up the number for that. You know all you'll find? You'll find alligator. They'll say, well, really, have you ever looked at Job 41? In Job 41, that says, on earth there is none his like. Well, that ain't an alligator. There's a bunch of alligators. I watch that fellow all the time. Shoot him, Lindy, boy, shoot him! He fills up that boat with alligators. Shoot him! Shoot him! You know, I like that thing. And them alligators get down there and they twist around and stuff like that. And they say that, that uh, men fear him. Well, man, that guy, what's that fellow's name? Troy, he don't fear no alligator, man. He, like, he'll jump down there and run a knife through his, between his eyes or something, you know. They ain't afraid of him. Not his like. There's hippopotamuses that are like. There's alligators that are like. You know what he says? He's the king over all the children of pride. An alligator's a king? You don't read your Bible. That Bible that he's talking about there, why, he's a fire-breathing thing. You've never seen a fire-breathing hippopotamus or an alligator. Unless he picks up one of your cigarettes or something, I guess. But I, you've never seen that. A day in your life you've never seen that. But you know what they do? Well, it has to be something earthly. Where do you get that? You're talking about heavenly things. Now, I, I know I'm, I'm being silly, but you've you got to realize when I don't understand what it is, leave it alone. It just means you don't know what it is. It just means God hadn't showed it to you yet. But don't try to change it so you can get it. You get in trouble that way. But what God really meant to say there was, leave it alone. If he'd have wanted to be in Hebrew, you know what he could have done? He could have left it in Hebrew. You know why he put it in English? Because he wanted you to read it. Right. But he did tell you to study to show yourself approved. So you know what you people are doing? You've got a, got a big crowd here tonight on a Wednesday night. You know what you're doing? You're studying. I haven't said one word to you about live right, do right, act right, spit white, don't smoke, don't cuss, don't drink, don't chew, make sure you go to church, make sure you tithe, make sure you visit, make sure you witness to people, read your Bible, pray. I said one word about that. All I'm doing here is just teaching you what the Bible says about a few things. You know what it'll do? It should make you get thirsty. It'd be like giving you a whole plate full of, uh, of uh, what's that noodly stuff? Pasta with a bunch of salt on it. And you get done, you drink water. Eat, it's like eating pizza. And you're up all night drinking water. And the next morning you get up, you look like the Michelin tire man, you know. Because you, <laughs> you swole up with all the, because you, because, right? I'm bloated, you know. You ate too much salt, now you're drinking all that water. <laughs> all right, the face of the sheep is frozen. Revelation chapter number 4, there's a door that's open there. Now watch what he says here in verse number 6. The Bible says in verse number 6, he said, And before the throne there was a... S well, how about that? Look at it, ladies, look at it, watch him. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Well, what would a sea of glass be like? Wouldn't it be like a mirror? Doesn't the Apostle Paul tell you, for now we see through a glass darkly? Why? You're looking at the wrong side of the mirror. And you look on the other side of the mirror, you say, what happens? Well, it's a strange sort of a thing, because when that door gets cracked open, you know what begins to take place there? And here's the Apostle Paul, he's on the road to Damascus, and the Bible says there in the book of Acts, chapter number 26, he's talking to Agrippa there and Felix, and he says this. He says, man, I was on the road to Damascus. I was round down there doing me a door to favor, and I was on my horse, man, and we were prancing down the thing, and all of a sudden I saw a light above the light of the sun. What happened? Somebody opened the door, man. You know what he says in the book of Revelation? In the book of Revelation he says, uh, there's no sun nor moon there. For you have no need of light, for the Lamb is the light thereof. Well, how come He's not lighting everything? Because His light is reflected upward into glory. So when you look up there, it's dark, man. I don't see nothing. It's dark. 
Lord says, you ought to see what I see on the other side over here. Yeah. On the other side over there, there's light up here. Not only that, it's absolute zero there. You say, what happens? It's called eternity. There's no time. That means you don't get old. You don't rot. You don't ever change. You're eternal. You're out of time. So the Lord can be in eternity and He can be in time. He can insert Himself in the time and go right back into eternity. That'll blow your mind, man. <laughs> it does mine anyway. My little pea brain about to explode when I was going back over all this stuff. All right, so what he says here is, is that this is called a sea of glass. Well, I don't know about you, but for me, that's pretty clear. It's like a mirror. It's frozen water. If the face of the deep is frozen, right? Sea of glass mingled with fire. What, is that? what does it look like? It's reflecting God's glory. It's like billions of diamonds down there, and they're reflecting, re refracting His light. They're bouncing it back up into heaven. You walk into heaven, man, it'll be like, good night, man, it's bright up here. And the Lord will say, oh, I forgot. Let me give you some glorified eyes so you can look at that stuff now. That's how the thing will be. Look in the book of Revelation, chapter number 15. Revelation 15. That's what's up there now. That's what you're going to kneel on one day. When I tell you you're going to be before a fire, there's a fire that's kindled up there that's in front of the throne of God. And when you get up there at the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to kneel on that frozen sea of glass in front of the throne of God. And you're going to be looking at your face in that thing and you're going to think, man, I don't look like myself at all. What is that looking back at me? And you're going to see the image of Jesus Christ looking at you. And then about that time, you're going to hear a voice like many thunderings and like many waters and lightnings proceeding out of the throne that's surrounded by a green rainbow and all that stuff's being refracted up there. And the Lord's going to say, did you love me? And you're going to say, Lord, did you hear the one about? Well, Lord, the reason I couldn't, whatever your excuse is, write it down. And you get up there to heaven, just pull it out and say, Lord, the reason I, Secret of life. That's what you're going to see. His glory reflected. Revelation chapter 15. I've got to get to this thing about the deeps here. <laughs> We're working on it. Revelation chapter number 15. This is a blessing. Verse number 2. Amen. The Bible says this. Uh, verse number 1. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels, heaven, seven last plagues, and then was filled with the wrath of God. And the Bible says, and I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and then had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and the number of his name. Stand, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Well, how do you stand on water? You just said it. What? It's got to be frozen. So water can take three shapes, right? Well, isn't that interesting? <laughs> Water can take on the shape of water, be liquid. Water can take on the same of bullet, and it can become steam. It can take on steam, like the spirit. And water can take on ice. It can be frozen and be hard. It can be all three, but it's the same thing. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Body, soul, spirit. Why, you're just like a cube of ice. Just... Get me loose in the tray so I can get out of here when it comes time to go, man. That's it. So you know what happens? You know what begins to take place, ladies and gentlemen? When the Holy Spirit begins to work in Ephesians chapter number 5, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, right? Amen. You know what happens? When you begin to heat that water up, you know what happens? The teapot begins to boil. And you know what happens to the teapot? It, that, boop! And that's hard nowadays because most Christians are not in the liquid form. Most Christians are frozen. And it takes a longer time to heat up an ice cube and get it to boil to create the steam that produces the action. Does a, a train in the old days, does a train run on water? Well, not in its liquid form. Does it run on ice? Not in its, not in its hard form, but it runs on a form of water. What does it run on? You know what gives it the power? You know what it's likened to? That's the Holy Ghost. But you've got to heat up the pot to produce the steam. And some people just will not be heated up. <laughs> Bless me if you can. <laughs> okay. That's where the thing goes. All right, so now what we got here is this. Uh, come to, oh, it'll be Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. All right, now this is where your deeps are. Uh, Brother Grider, you're the one that started this whole mess. Amen. This is where the deeps are. The deeps are over your head and they're below your feet. 
Now, I don't know this for sure, but there's a, there's a, there's a possibility. There's a possibility because the Bible says the Lord sitteth upon the circle of the earth. There's a possibility that inside this thing right here, there's a possibility that these things are connected this way. Now, I don't know this, but the Lord seems to favor circles. You say, where do you get that stuff? Well, you've got three triangles down here on the earth. And in those three triangles, he's got the Bermuda Triangle, which is down here um, uh, off of Bermuda, down there around uh, the Bahamas and stuff. And then you've got the Devil's Triangle, which is up there around uh, Japan. And then you've got the Mariana Trench, which is the other one. And those three, they say, are interconnected. Well, I know that they are. You say, how do you know something like that? You don't know nothing. You're not an astrophysicist, and you're not a, a geologist. How would you know that? Because when the Lord says to Satan, he said, where have you been? He said, oh, I've been walking to and fro. Did you get it? In the earth. In the earth, among the stones of fire. Where has he been? Walking around, pop up over here in Japan, pop up over here in Florida, pop up over here, pop up over here. Say what? Walking in and out of the earth. It's all interconnected. You know how your earth is made? It's made in a circle. You know how that thing in hell is? I draw it like a square, but that thing's made like a donut. <laughs> you would know a policeman would think that, wouldn't you? <laughs> I used to, I, sorry. <laughs> I was there for a long time, so I, you know, okay, so. <laughs> Got a hole in the middle. It's a great gulf fixed. On the inside of that thing is hell, and that thing is a gulf, and on the outside of that thing is paradise. I don't know that that thing is connected like that, but it would stand to reason because the earth is round, the planets are round, the, the sun is round. But it, it makes sense that they may be, and that would mean that he's able to get, now I drew it, the triangle would actually be outside that thing like this, out here like this, that way, and that would mean that the devil is free to move in that thing anywhere he wants to be, anytime he wants to be. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says the whole earth lieth in that wicked one. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says when the Lord comes, he comes into the strong man's house. Well, you know who the God of this world is? 2 Corinthians chapter 4? It's the devil. The whole world lieth in that wicked one. You know what the Bible says? He cometh like a thief in the night to steal away. Who's he stealing? He's taking me out of the wicked one. He reaches right into the jaws of him and pulls me right out of his belly. Amen. Well, my, 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 where was Jonah? As Jonah was in the belly of the... What? It's probably a coincidence. All right, now, uh, are we in Genesis 7 yet? Are you in Genesis chapter number 7? Yes, sir. Okay, Genesis chapter number 7, around verse number 11. Now you'll understand this statement that seems in and of itself, if you just read over it and you didn't know all this stuff right here, now I'm just going to read the Bible... And you just tell me what comes to your mind. The Bible says Noah went in and his sons and his wives and so on and so forth. And the beast came in and so on and so forth. And verse number 10, and it came to pass after seven days the waters of the flood were upon the earth. And the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all of the fountains of the great deep broken up. And the windows of heaven were opened. Well, how would you break water unless it was ice? The fountains, the, the thing that the dam's holding back, what do you do? Why, well, Second Kings 7, you open the windows in heaven. You crack them open. The fountains of the great deep, what does he do? He breaks the dam and lets all that water come down on the earth like rain. And then he seals and shuts the windows and closes it all. And then after the amount of time Noah's down here, the water's assuaged, it goes back up. He doesn't take this earth right here and recreate Genesis chapter number 1 and divide the waters from the waters. You know why? Because he tells you in Genesis chapter number 7, the waters were assuaged from off the face of the earth. They're mopped up. They evaporate. This flood right here, it's completely done. And he takes the waters and divides them from the waters. This one right here... It's like a major flood, but it doesn't overwhelm the whole earth. He gradually lets it go back off the earth after however many the days are. I forget the number of days now. Some of y'all probably remember. And so this is Noah's flood right here. 
Let me show you this thing about the windows. Come over to uh, 2 Kings chapter number 7. 2 Kings chapter number 7. And verse number 1. 2 Kings chapter number 7, verse number 1. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in Samaria. And the Lord in whose hand the king leaned, uh, 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 leaned answered the man of God, saying, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. The guy's making fun of him. He said, oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like this is really going to happen. You mean in a day's time there, preacher, this is going to take place? <laughs> That's like asking the Lord to make windows in heaven. And Elisha says, well, you're going to see that it's a true statement, but you're not going to be able to eat anything of it. You say, why? Well, a little bit later on, verse number 19, you know what happens. Uh, everything takes place like the preacher said it was going to take place. And the people go out and they spoil the temple of the Syrians and they got all the food that they're going to have and the famine's over with and everything's done. And the Bible says in verse number 19, uh, I'm verse 18, and it came to pass as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel, a measure of fine flour for a shekel, shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. For the Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. And so it fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gates, and he died. When God says there's windows in heaven, there's windows in heaven. The fountains of the great deeps were broken up. He broke the dams, and he let the water come down. You say, why? He had frozen them. There he submerged them in water that they were floating in, like a bass coming along or a brim, grabbing your hook and taking that cork underneath the water and submerging it completely, that's what the Lord did, but the cork didn't come back up. He let that thing sit down there and become a mud ball in darkness upon the face of the deeps. While the deeps never go away, it wasn't darkness upon the face of the seas or the oceans or the rivers or the lakes or the ponds or the mud puddles for that matter. Darkness upon the face of the deep. Why? No light. Sun's out, moon's out, everything's drowned it out. So what does he do? Divides the waters from the waters and says, let there be light. There it is. Darkness upon the face of the deeps. The deeps never go away. He takes the same deeps and he just simply divides them. So that's all the great deeps are. Job chapter 41. Job chapter number 41. Now, to me, of course, I've, I've done this a few times, but to me, uh, uh, believe it or not, that all makes sense to me. I can see now where the, where the word deeps there is the water that that thing floated in and out of, and when the Lord overflowed that thing with water, he never did away with all the water in the universe. It's in a container. He just simply divided the water from the water and made, it our, made our solar system. And he put the greater light to rule the day, the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night, the moon, and the stars in the solar system between the water. It's strange to me the other day, they said the Hubble, the other day, it's been a while now, they said the Hubble telescope went up there and that there was this big up thing up, up, up there that the best they could determine, it looked like mesh. Said it, it, it looks like up there, like there's this big expanse of this stuff like mesh and on the other side of that mesh, it's, it's like it, this mesh is holding back all of this water. <laughs> Science just said that. What's that mesh? Why, if you've read the Song of Solomon, mesh is called lattice, like lattice work. Well, guess what the Bible says? He peepeth at his bride through the lattice. And science says, there's this thing up there that looks like a... Oh, here's what they call it. They said it's like a giant grid. 
of inner working, inner locking lines. And the best we can determine, there's something on the other side that we've never grasped, but it looks like it's full of water. And I'm like, I can tell you what that is if you'd like. <laughs> I, mean, I, can, I can show you, you know, what it is if you'd like to then give me about $300 we can pay off, $300,000 we can pay off our mortgage of the, of the church building. <laughs> what is that? It's called the deeps. Is that too deep for you? <laughs> Let me show you what that is. You know, show them that right there and say, well, that's what that thing is. And that lattice right there is the thing the Lord put in place. And he's, one day you're going to look up. You ever look at a real, real good moon? And you get to look at that thing, and it's almost like the Lord's like this. And I'm thinking, I wonder if that's just one of his eyes, and he's just looking, <laughs> peeping at you through the lattice. That's the Lord. That's your Savior. Amen. That's the one that made you. And science is Hubble telescope. There's a, there's a grid up there. Lines, crossing lines, intersecting lines, and there's water. If we could tap that water, why we would, we would never have a water problem. No, I guess you wouldn't. <laughs> the whole earth's been submerged in that before, and he used just a little smidgen of it to drown out another earth one time before, but he said he wouldn't do it anymore. And they had this big flood over there and wherever that thing was, Sri, Sri Lanka and in Japan. They, the fellow said to me, he said, the Lord said he never destroys the earth with a flood. And I said, your idea of what a flood is and God's idea of a flood is different. I said, God's flood flooded the top of Mount Everest, man. It rained until the water rose up. Institution, Institute for Creation and Research says this. It says that when he says the fountains of the great deep, what he means is, is that the bottoms of the rivers and oceans, there was a great earthquake and water that was in the earth sprung up out of the earth and flooded the earth. Now stop and think about that. You're limited the amount of water. The fountains of the great deep were broken up. You say, what happened? The Bible said it rained. It didn't come from underneath the earth. It came from up above. Where's rain come from? It don't come from the ground. But people take that because the guy's got THD, PhD, and all the other stuff. And they go, oh, that's wow. See, that proves, that, that proves the Bible's right. No, it doesn't matter whether you think it's right or not. The Bible's right, period. Science doesn't have to qualify it. The fountains of the great deep, where are they? They're over your head. The Lord just said, uh, Gabriel, Michael, come here. And you here, Sonny Boy, you angel in training. <laughs> Come grab them windows and bust them open. I'll tell you when to close them. And they go over there and, you know, and you start hearing things like styrofoam lids, like a glacier up there in, in the north. You start hearing that thing crack and seize and pop and grind. All that water pressure is against it. And that thing cracks open like that. And all of a sudden, buddy, down through the solar system comes gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons of water. Not from clouds, thunder, lightning, no mention of that at all. That's the Lord just, just opened it up. And he says, I figured you need a little drink of water. How's that? And he drowns out the whole thing. And then six days, that thing has got the whole earth covered. That's a lot of rain, man. And then the Lord said, turn the spigot off. Oh, I'm sorry, fellas. Y'all can't stop it. And he didn't have a red cape and an S on his chest and live in an ice castle and was afraid of kryptonite. Well, isn't that what he does? Doesn't he, isn't he able to go and freeze something? Where'd they get that? I just showed you that's the breath of the Lord. With the breath of the Lord, he straightened the waters. When the Lord got ready to quit raining, he just froze it back up again. That's funny about the Lord. He can breathe fire in one place and breathe cold in another. He's everything you need. Job chapter 41. We'll, well, I don't even know what time it is. All right. Job chapter 41. That's a, that's a big God you're going to go see one day. All right, let, me, let me give you this thing here in, uh, before I get to this in Job 41. Let me give you this thing. It's, it'll, be in, uh, it'll be in Psalms. It'll be in Psalms. It has to do with that pre-Adamite thing. Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Preacher, I just don't believe in that kind of a theory. Okay. Well, for me, it's not a theory. It's a, I, I believe it's a doctrine. I mean, when I say it's a doctrine, I believe it's, it's, it's proven. I believe it's biblically true. I don't care if science believes it or not. You can't prove evolution. You can't prove theistic evolution. People believe it as a doctrine. 
You can't even prove what you say you believe as far as creation. You can't prove there wasn't something here before. You sure do have a hard time with Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, where we started, where he says, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish. Well, why would he use the word replenish? Well, that was a scribal error. Aren't you so smart? <laughs> you know, you don't even realize what you're messing with when you say something like that. You're saying that a God that can preserve your soul can't preserve some words on a page. Well, then my soul must be in danger. If God can, can't preserve a word, what makes me think he can preserve? Because I'm based on words he preserved that my, my salvation's sure. Well, if he messed up that word, well, how do I know he didn't mess up the word on salvation? You don't even realize what you say. You say, well, God, what God really meant to say there in the passage was, was really fill because there's no way nothing was here before. Hey, buddy, he said replenish. Well, there's, there's, there's just no way that can happen. Scientifically, we know that the earth has only been here 6,000 years. Where did you get that? Who told you that? You know what the Lord could do? The Lord would like to do stuff like this. The Lord would like to go out here and uh, create, the, say, for instance, the redwood forest in day number one and put an 800-year-old tree right out in the middle of it and say, boy, when they cut into that tree, they're going to be in a mess. They're going to think that tree is several thousand years old. <laughs> I planted it yesterday. <laughs> You, you get well, it came up from a seedling, and we look at its rings, and we determine by its rings how many years it's been living here. Wow, really? And there's no way that the earth could have been here more than 6,000 years. No, since Adam, you could say that. But you can't determine the age of the dirt ball you're on. You don't know how long it was here. In the beginning, when was that? It sure wasn't the baseball game the other night, the big inning. <laughs> in the beginning when was it I don't know God says he's the alpha and the omega suppose he flung it out there when he first existed and spun it out there and says boys y'all hang around down there you got no idea how long was it after he drowned it out before he decided to divide the waters from the waters you think he some kind of a God that's got to be doing something all the time maybe he let it sit there in darkness for a while maybe he didn't do nothing maybe he let it sit there a million years what's it to him one day's a thousand years a thousand years is a day what difference does it make to him when he made it? Now, you can start your clock with Adam. You can say 6,000 years with Adam, but you can't say that the earth, it, because when Adam got on the earth, he was already on a pre-existent earth. That's why all this carbon dating and all this other kind of stuff, that don't tell you squat. This thing could have been here for billions of years for that matter. That's why all their scientific stuff gets messed up. They go, well, we know that this has been here over a billion years. And then the creation research people and the people say, there's no way it was here a billion years. It can't happen because God said he started with Adam. It can't be over 6,000 years old. You're just showing your stupid ignorance. You can't say that any more than you know what happened with dinosaurs. Are dinosaurs really real? I don't know. Behemoth in Job 38 and uh, in Job 41 is, uh, is Leviathan. They're reptilian creatures. But both of them, one's on the type of the Antichrist, one on the type of Satan. So it could be that if he turned those two into a reptilian creature, it could be that, that when the angels fell, maybe he made them reptilian creatures. It could be that they were partial reptilian creatures and partial human beings, 25, 30 feet tall. Have you read the books and do you understand? They don't find full skeletons of nothing. They put it together with wire and paper mache. Do you want to believe in dinosaur? Go ahead. You know, they were here billions of years ago. Okay. It still doesn't conflict the Bible even if they were. He created birds and four-footed beasts and all that other kind of stuff and created human beings and all that. But that first creation, man, that thing's geological. It's hard. You say, how do you know? Isaiah 14, every precious stone was I covering, the topaz, the beryl, the onyx, the sapphire, the diamond, this and that, and the other, all through that thing. The type picture of that priest wearing that linen ephod, and then he puts that, uh, that, that thing on him with the 12 stones in there, and him walking in the stones of fire. It's geological. The next creation is supple, soft, trees, leaves, leaves <coughs> bending around, flesh, not hard, granite, that kind of thing, not like a diamond. Diamond, you know what the molecular weight of a diamond is? Does anybody know? You know what, how it's dated? Look it up. <laughs> how come it doesn't show up in the children of Israel on the best plate? 
I, I, don't, I don't know why they would put something like that there. I don't know why there would be such an affinity for that. I've wondered oftentimes, besides that fellow sitting there behind that tree and saying, Yea, hath God said, I wonder if he's sitting there flashing a big old stone at her. Now, there's nothing wrong. Don't go throw your diamonds on the altar and say, I can't have a diamond and all that other kind of stuff and all. But it seems to be a cheap imitation of what something God's trying to do. I'm just saying, now, men, you can't go out of here and say, no, now that I know that, I don't have to buy my wife a diamond ring. <laughs> That's the devil, you know, and that kind of thing. Psalms 24. Psalms 24, verse number 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it, it upon the floods. Well, that's not yours. He found it upon the seas. Upon. If it's on something, upon something, isn't it resting on top of it? Well, that goes right along with Second Peter chapter 3. The earth floating in the water and out of the water. That's the first earth. The first earth was half in the water and half out. That's where it was. That's the best I can do with that. All right, now back to Job chapter 41. Job chapter number 41. That's the carbon weight of that. I'm sorry, I said weight. That's the carbon weight, 666. That's the mineral. Uh, let's see. Give me just one second here. Let me look one thing up here. Uh, go over to Revelation uh, 21, just TK. The rest of you stay right here in, jo in Job. Go to Revelation, I believe it'll be 21, and it'll give you the the stones of the city there and and get me that and then I'll I'll close this thing out. All right, Job chapter number 41. Let me let me clarify this because we're on on this. Verse number 1, canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? All right, now we got to figure out what this Leviathan thing is just so that you know. All right, leave your finger right there. Come to the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter number 27. Psalms chapter number 27. Just go forward just a few pages and you'll run right into the book of Psalms. Psalm 74 and Isaiah 27. Psalm 74 and Isaiah 27. I may have given you the wrong reference there. Psalm 74 and then it will be Isaiah 27. All right, Isaiah 27 first, 27, uh, 1. The Bible says this, verse number 1. In that, that day, the Lord with his sore and great strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing servant, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the where? Now, let me ask you a question. You think the Lord's going to come down here with a harpoon and stick an alligator or stick a crocodile or stick a, har or stick a harpoon in a hippopotamus? Have you ever thought that these scholars, when they write something like that, they don't even think? The Lord's going to come down here and he tells you what Leviathan is. He says he's the crooked serpent. He says he's the dragon. Well, who doesn't know that? He's got seven heads. That's Revelation 13. Seven heads. He's a red dragon. Where is he? He's in the deeps. All right, look at this thing in Psalms, chapter number 74. Psalms, chapter number 74. And the Bible says this in verse number 13. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou, divide, thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads, plural, of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the, to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Who would have ever thought that manna came from up over your head? Psalms chapter 78, called Devil's Food Cake. Broke the head of Leviathan, didn't he? I saw as one of the dragon's heads as if it were wounded. Didn't he just say, Thou breakest the head of the Leviathan, and thou givest him to be bread for them to eat? Psalms chapter 78, verse number 24. And it rained down manna upon them to eat. He had given them the corn of heaven, and man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the fool. You say, what was that? He busted somebody's head up there and gave them manna from that. That's right there in your Bible. Preacher, I don't, I don't believe it. Okay, well, 
whatever. <laughs> Back to Job 41. Did you find the? Uh, is there a is there a list in there for a diamond? Yes, no sir. There's no there's no diamond in there. Yes, Are you kidding me? No diamond. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Oh. So in the 12 stones that are on that city, they match the 12 stones in the uh, priest breastplate, right? Yes, sir. All right. Now, if you get time, you look this up. In Ezekiel chapter number 28, when he's describing the devil, he says, Every precious stone was thy covering, and there's a stone in there called a diamond, and it's not there in the priest's stones, and it's not there in the stones of the city. Why does the Lord leave that thing out? Just asking you a question. You know where that comes from? That thing comes from in the heart of the earth. You know what it is? It's earth off as a chunk of coal, carbon. You know what it does? It gets under pressure and it gets under high heat and it turns into a diamond. Comes out of the heart of the earth. All right, back to the book, Job chapter number 41. I'm all for diamonds. Get you diamonds. Zarconian's a lot cheaper, but get you a diamond. Nobody can tell the difference. Last time I checked, nobody comes around here and and, uh, and gets their little jeweler's thing out to see whether or not it's real. Uh, one lady told me one time, she said, Preacher, as much money as we paid for this diamond, I'm going to go around with a certificate for the diamond's reality or, or, or qualifications printed on my back so everybody know that it's a real diamond. <laughs> that didn't go over too good. Verse number 9, talking about this thing, Leviathan, which we just identified. It's the devil. It's the twisted serpent. It's the crooked serpent. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? You're afraid of him. None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Well, it leaves Troy out if it's an alligator. I mean, it leaves him out if he's a crocodile. Who then is able to stand before me? Who hath prevented me that I should repay him whatsoever is under the whole heavens is mine? Well, he's talking about repaying somebody something. The Lord's saying, why should I give the devil anything? I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? And who can come to him with a double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? And the teeth are terrible and round about. His scales are his pride. Why, well, Satan's the father of pride. Shut up together as with a close seal. They're, they're, they're together, they're bound up, like kind of like a space suit. One is so near uh, unto another that no air can come between them. They're joined one to another. They stick together. They cannot be asunder. His kneesings, that's his blowing out of his nose. A light doth shine. His eyes or eyelids are as of the morning. They're bright lights. Uh, out of his mouth goeth burning lamps and sparks of fire. He's a fire-breathing dragon. Out of his nostrils goes smoke and a seething pot. That's a good, I guess, a good verse for not smoking cigarettes. He's like the devil. Wow. Uh, come down to verse number 31. Y'all must be getting tired. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea uh, like a point of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. Well, you know what he says about him over there? He said, I saw Satan fall as lightning. He maketh the path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary, white, illuminated. Upon the earth is not his light. Well, how is that, a hippopotamus or an alligator? Who is made without fear? Why, an alligator is afraid, and so is a hippopotamus. Who beholdeth high things? I will, Isaiah 14, right over there. I will ascend. What does he do? He behold high things. He wants them. And watch it. He's a king over all the children of pride. Well, how about that? Well, that thing has to be the devil then. Well, where is he? He's a seven-headed red dragon. Come to Revelation chapter 12. We'll close with this. I'll give you all the stuff on the angels later. It's too, too late. We've been going at this thing for about over two hours now. Y'all have had... Pretty, you've been a real good audience listening tonight. Amen. Amen. Really have. You've been very, very attentive, and I, I appreciate it. You're a pastor's dream. I'm serious. You're a pastor's dream. I'm sorry, it's 13. I'm sorry, it's 12. 12 and then 13. There you go. Revelation 12, verse number 9, verse number 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought with his angels and prevailed not. Neither their place found any more in heaven. Where are they? Where are they? Where's the battle take place? He's not in hell. He's not in the heart of the earth. Where is he at? Where's Michael fight him? He fights him in heaven. Well, where is this thing at right here? 
where are the deeps? Well, wouldn't you say that it's in the heavens? Mm -hmm. There's war in heaven. Where is it? It can't be up here where God's at. And it ain't in the solar system where you are. It's in this thing right here. There's war in heaven. Where is it? It's right up there. That's outer space. That's up there in the deeps. You say, what happened? That's where he's up there swimming. He comes out of the sea. Watch what he says. The Bible says, and, that, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. You know the sad thing? You know the scary thing? He's already lost this battle one time before. He shows up in Genesis chapter 3 already as a fallen angel. I mean already as a fallen cherub as Satan. He shows up in Genesis chapter 3. And I'll be jumped if that bird don't do it again right here. And he gets cast down to earth and comes down here in a time called the tribulation. He's cast down to earth. And guess what happened? A third of the angels follow after him. That's not the same ones that went up here. That's a third of the ones that are there now. He must be a pretty convincing fellow. And these charismatics think they can do battle with him? I'm going to step on the devil's tail, you know. And I, maybe you, you, get his, you draw his attention while we all run. <laughs> Go ahead, help yourself. Good luck, buddy. I'll be praying for you. In the name of Jesus, help yourself, you know. Really. All right, look at what he says in Revelation chapter number 13. And he stood at the sand of the sea and saw a beast, a beast, a beast, rise up out of the sea, having seven heads. There he is, and ten horns, ten crowns upon his head. The name, and the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion. He speaks English. Feet of a bear. He moves like a communist. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat in great authority. It's a type of the Antichrist. Verse number 4, they worship the dragon. Well, now he's come down. He's a shapeshifter. So now he comes down and he's no longer a seven-headed red dragon. Well, don't be marveled by that. The Bible says his ministers are ministers of righteousness, but then no marvel. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm quoting to you. He says, for Satan himself can appear, can appear, can appear as an angel of light. Well, how do angels appear? Well, I already showed you. I already gave them. I'll give you the verses on it. But I already told you, every time an angel appears, he appears as a man. How do you think the devil appeared in the garden as a snake? They got him drawn all the time. He looks like a muskrat or something up there, and he's a talking animal and stuff like that. No, man, he's up there. He looks like Fabio or something, you know, and he's <laughs> talking to this girl and saying, hey, listen, man, your old man, he ain't the only man around. <laughs> you, look, you look like you've been, uh, uh, you've, you've been uh, uh, ignored. You need somebody to talk to, honey? Come here, let me talk to you. Well, you know, he just, he just, he doesn't listen to me. Oh, I, I know, I'm, I'm here to listen to you. you, know, you what you, what you got to say? Well, you know, the Lord said we can't have this and we can't have that. I just don't understand all these rules and that kind of stuff. And never one time did you, by the way, where's your husband? And the woman, you know, she's like, oh, well, then finally somebody will listen to me. I, he likes to talk and I love to talk and he's talking and carrying on a conversation and isn't this wonderful? I'm having communication. And he says, how'd you like this right here? And she said, oh, no, the Lord said we can't touch it. And the devil said, hmm, he didn't say that, but okay, baby, we'll go with it. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, watch this. I'm touching it, not hurting me. He said, well, I think he said, you, and, and you can't eat it. He goes, doesn't bother me none. Yea, hath God said, you know what the problem is, sugar. They're trying to suppress you and keep you down. They don't want you to have your equal rights. The problem is, is that you're not getting your voice. I mean, this is just a bad thing. The way God set that thing up, he, he, you know, now God, what the, really the truth is, is that God was afraid you'd become like him. Isn't that what he says? You shall be as gods. You shall not die. You shall be as gods. What gods he talking about? While the angels are still able to go back and forth in the garden, folks, they see angels all the time. It's no big deal. You shall be as angels, like, like God, like angels. You're going to be like them, man. Well, who wouldn't want to be like them? Here today, gone tomorrow, walking around out here, man. I mean, man, wouldn't it be, you know what? God just don't want you to take this because he don't want you to be like them. Not gods like you're thinking in your mind. You, it, it, they can see them. There they are. Oh, man, what is that? Hey, how you doing, man? Good to see you. Because they can do supernatural feats. And she says, really, that's it, huh? He said, sure, watch. Eats it. Next thing you know, here comes Adam and says, my goodness, Snow White, what happened to you? You're blushing. 
We went from a water circulatory system to a blood system, and she blushes. Before that, she's given a garment of light, and the lights went out. And Adam said, honey, what'd you do? He said, well, you know, I, I was talking to this fellow over here the other day. Did a little more than talk, didn't you, baby? You kind of lost the rose of purity off your cheeks there. Something's happened to you. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. Oh, I've gotten a man from the Lord. So where did Abel come from? Came from Adam. You know what I just saw last week? I just saw headline news. You know what the thing was? A woman has twins by two different daddies. It's on the news. It's all a preacher never happened. Really? Genesis 3, buddy. Where do you think Cain came from? John chapter number 8, verse number 44. He was a murderer from the beginning. That wasn't the devil. That's Cain. That's his seed. He was a murderer from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, Rosemary's baby. You say, preacher, why would you believe something like that? Oh, why would you believe the Bible? Why would you believe Genesis chapter number 6 took place and you wouldn't believe that that took place? I don't know how the thing took place. I know this. I know that when the devil's there, I know that he winds up having... You ever look at Judas? Judas Iscariot. He was a devil from the beginning when the Lord chose him. Well, how'd that happen? Say, well, his daddy was Simon the Leopard. Well, if it is, the Bible says when the Lord picked him, he was a devil. He's in a human body. But who wants to believe the Bible? Okay, well, that's got to be enough for tonight. <laughs> Lock your doors and windows tonight. <laughs> listen, folks, that's why I tell you, that it, you this stuff, you, listen, can you listen to me just a second, and, I'll, and I'll, I really will close, I, I promise. You listen to me for a second. Uh, this stuff you're dealing with is outside your realm of understanding. And you start messing around with this demonic stuff and all that kind of deal, you think, you know, it's all, it's, it's no big deal, and oh, it's just a bunch of preachers trying to keep me from having fun. Let me tell you something. Uh, this thing is, is smarter. It, next to God, it's the smartest thing in the universe. And you start playing around with that stuff, it'll get you and convince you you're right and you deserve it. And it can twist you every which way for Sunday. And the best thing to do is to not stay at arm's length. Don't get around it. Now, you know, you can throw off on the woman and all this other kind of stuff. The Bible says she was deceived in her childbearing. She thought she got a man from the Lord. Well, it didn't. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. Well, I choose not to believe the evil's wicked. Okay, fine, I don't matter. I won't argue with you. Make no difference. He's a murderer. Who's the first murderer in your Bible? From the beginning. The devil didn't kill Abel. Cain did. His offspring. What do you think the Antichrist is? He's the offspring of the devil. So how do you get that? It'll be Judas. Every time it's Judas. The son of... The son of... Let me help you this way. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make it clear for you. Who is Jesus Christ? Is he not God's son? But he is God, right? Manifest in the flesh. All right? God has a son, Jesus Christ. The devil has a son. Who is it? The Antichrist. It'll be Judas Iscariot. And when he comes up, he's inhabited by the devil's spirit. When he eats the sop, Satan entered into him. Same thing happened in the tribulation. What will happen is the Antichrist will come up there and he'll be peace, 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 peace. And he'll be giving you that bad right eye. Like, you know, and, and he'll be... Somebody will shoot him, blow his eyes out or whatever it'll be. I don't know what it'll be. But it'll strike his eye and he's got a bad arm. And then the next thing you know, Satan enters his body. And he resurrects after three days. And people will swear it's Jesus Christ. And they'll follow after him. Second Thessalonians chapter number 2. And God shall send them all strong delusion who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness that they all might be damned. God will let them believe that's Jesus Christ and go to hell believing it because they had a chance to get the truth and because they wouldn't take the truth and because they ignored the truth. God said, fine, you can go to hell with it then. Now, I can't get a God like that, but, but that's him. So you know what you ought to do tonight? You get on your knees tonight. You get ready to pray. 
you ought to say, God, thank you for being merciful to me, a sinner, and thank you for showing me through the Holy Spirit what your Bible has to say, and I have to confess, Lord, I don't know, maybe understand all this stuff, but I know this, I understand enough about it that you're a mighty big God, and that you've got stuff going on that I can't even possibly fathom in my mind, and not only are the things you prepared for me that I love, but Lord, I realize I don't fear and tremble like I should before you, and I've acted like a big shot and a smart aleck thinking I know everything about all the doctrine and how everybody ought to live and what they ought to do. And God, you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm just going to shut up and be quiet for a while and, and just let you be you. And thank God that he hadn't just snuffed me and you, both of us, out. Okay. You've been mighty good tonight. I appreciate it. You sat here for two hours and nearly 20 minutes. Amen. So you've been wonderful. You're good, so I'll stand together. We'll be dismissed. I hope.